Now, let's look at uh, the firm and the market structures. Primarily, uh, focusing on a typical economist classification of the market structures. Economists uh, classify the market structures into four broader categories. One, they talk about uh, perfectly competitive markets, perfect competition. Then we are talking about uh, monopolistic competitive markets. Then we have oligopoly. And finally, it is monopoly. Of course, there could be a few more additional uh, classification, but this forms the significant uh, differentiating classifications uh, for different kinds of industries and different kinds of products. And just to understand the key characteristics of each one of them, in a perfect competition, we find too many sellers who are very small, which means the market share of the individual sellers are much, much lesser. And because the market share is much lesser, none of them have a typical pricing power. They are all the price takers only. They accept the price which the market goes with, but they cannot typically play a key role in terms of setting the prices. The reason being, what they typically sell are all homogeneous products. Right? No product differentiation exists in a perfect competition. So, whatever the products they are selling, there are perfect substitutes available for those products, which means if they try to increase the price of their product a little bit, they are going to lose out to their competitors. And these are such kind of products where entry barriers are very, very low, exit barriers are very, very low, which is also indicating that anyone can enter into that particular business at any point in time, and anyone can leave at any point in time. And these kind of markets do not require any kind of advertising or branding because they do not offer any kind of specialized or differentiated kind of a products. So the advertising and branding is only going to increase their cost, but it is not going to do anything for them. So no advertising and branding. And... From the producer's perspective, they have a perfectly elastic demand curve. What does this mean? The demand curve is pretty much horizontal. This is also saying that if they try to decrease the price a little bit, they are going to get a very heavy demand. But at the same time, if they are going to increase the price a little bit, they are going to lose out on the overall customers uh, uh, very heavily. That is where we are saying they have a perfectly elastic demand curve. And uh, uh, this is where their consumer and producer surplus is getting maximized. They will sell at equilibrium quantity itself. Right, these are the ones they have to sell equilibrium quantity at the equilibrium price. And that is the reason there is no dead weight loss at all in case of perfectly competitive market, which is also saying that uh, the summation of the consumer surplus and producer surplus is very perfectly maximized under the perfect competition situation. Right? Now, Moving on to the next important structure, the monopolistic uh, competition. Here, one important differentiator is the products are not homogeneous. They are differentiated products. So, they are not homogeneous, which means there is a differentiation in the product, either on lines of quality they, they differentiate it based on the quality, they differentiate it uh, based on the features built into the product. 
So which means uh, they try to project their product is different from that of their competitors. Right? And that is the reason they have marketing and advertising because they have to communicate that their product is different. So the marketing and advertising costs are slightly higher in terms of monopolistic competition. But at the same time, we see there are many producers. It's not a market that is dominated just by five or ten players. Any number of players can enter into the market. Some of them are branded players. Some of them are unbranded kind of a players, especially as for something like cloth, something like uh, 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 detergent powders, something like soaps, you will find so many players, some branded, some unbranded, and uh, the way the firms try to promote their differentiated products is majorly through marketing and advertising, right? And they are, even in that market, they are low entry and exit barriers, though they are not that low as that of perfect competition, you will find that the Entry and the exit barriers are much, much lower in monopolistic competition. But one thing we have to understand, though the marketing and advertising expenditures are very, very high, the benefits that are being realized by different firms is completely different. It may very well result in the inefficient use of resources also. So there has to be a pretty much... Uh, uh, a, a perfect game plan to be put up in order uh, to reach the customers and try to get their products sold to a great extent. And they do have pricing power to some extent. We see some of the branded products are priced slightly much higher compared to the unbranded products. So they have, as long as they are able to communicate the features of the product, the differentiation of the product quite heavily, effectively to the customers, they have the pricing power as well. But they are not price takers at least because they face a downward sloping demand curve. The firm is having a downward sloping demand curve. So they can, and individual firms also can play at any layer because they can talk about uh, they being uh, they being uh, product differentiators, they can choose a price somewhere here, from where here, somewhere here and target that particular quantity which they can really go with. So they are. that is the reason we call that in these markets they are price searchers, so they are not price takers. Right? They are not having one single price. In case of perfect competition, the price is perfectly horizontal. So the demand curve is perfectly horizontal, the price is perfectly horizontal, they have to take that price otherwise they are out because it's a perfectly elastic demand curve. Whereas uh, with respect to uh, the monopolistic competition, it's a downward sloping demand curve for the, for the firm so they can very well choose the price at which they would like to operate. Right, that's the reason I'm saying the, last, the demand curve is less elastic. It's not perfectly horizontal. Uh, it's not a perfectly elastic kind of a demand curve. It is less elastic, especially when new and innovative products are coming up. In that case, probably uh, the pricing power is much, much higher. But of course, if that product is a real good hit, a lot of competitors will enter into the market and that pricing power is constantly going to go up. Which means in a monopolistic competition, one of the important things that a firm needs to really look at is constantly keep innovating the products, constantly try promoting. That's where you see with respect to uh, uh, either a toothpaste or a soap, you will find, uh, or, a, or a shampoo or a detergent, we will find that uh, every, uh, every uh, few months, a new product comes out from a company with a different feature altogether. Because the more and more they are innovative in the product features, the more they are uh, able to survive in that market. That is how a monopolistic uh, Competition is operating. Then, 
the most important thing which we see with respect to oligopoly is you hardly have a few sellers. The producers are very few, 5 to 10 producers overall. Look at the airline market, right? No local players operating, very few. Or probably look at the telecom sector. You have 5 to 10 players and uh, not, uh, not too many local players operating. So mostly uh, all are branded uh, uh, companies. You hardly uh, see any kind of local market being operated in that because the entry and the exit barriers are very, very high. It's pretty much costly uh, to enter into that uh, business or even exit out of the business. And in some cases, the products could be homogeneous or they could be differentiating. If there is a differentiating, obviously, uh, advertising and branding costs are much, much higher. Even if they are homogeneous uh, product, the advertising costs are much higher itself because it has to be a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, it has to be a kind of uh, bus creation uh, at any point in time. So even the oligopolies also involve branding and advertising costs. But what we see is in monopolistic competition, that cost is uh, much, much higher. And of course, they have a very good pricing power, right? Because uh, even in their case, you see that the firm's uh, demand curve is downward sloping. But uh, what we typically uh, see is when I compare it with the monopolistic uh, competition, the demand curve may be, uh, may be either more elastic in some cases or less elastic in some cases compared to the monopolistic competition. And economies of scale are much, much higher because uh, they, they, they are able to uh, uh, capture a significant market share because very few players and all of them are more or less uh, equally uh, sized or equally competitive. So we find that uh, the economies of scale are much higher, their pricing power is much higher, but a few things very key to that of oligopoly is there's a lot of interdependence among the firm. Means their pricing, their advertising, they are all interdependent. Probably if one firm one firm starts advertising, within the next few days, you see that the other firms also will follow the suit. One firm has reduced the price, probably we see that the other firms are also responding accordingly. So their, their actions are pretty much dependent on the actions of their competitors. So they see, so typically we see that follow the leader kind of an approach comes up. Whosoever is the lead player in that particular market, whatever the step, whatever the strategy that is taken by that particular player, it would be quite comfortably followed by the rest of the companies in the oligopolistic market. And coming to the monopoly, another uh, firm structure, we see only one single firm. Right, only one single producer and the seller, in short, talking about even if there are three, four, the market share of the largest player is the significant, which is a very clear indication that the demand curve is going to be a downward sloping itself and uh, the monopoly has the kind of a power to really choose what should be the price. Right, but yes, where is this monopoly power coming from? The entry barriers are very, very high, either because of the government policies or because of the economies of scale, some kind of uh, controls that are there, copyrights, patents, because of whatever things uh, they have created, very high entry barrier. No one else can enter into that particular. Uh, segment at least for a few possible years and they have a full control over the resources of that particular in that particular country or in that particular product right and this is where we use the word natural monopoly 
wherein the economies of scale are so significant that no one else can meet the, the no one else can meet the required demand this particular firm only can meet the demand of, uh, which has to be supplied by the by only one firm and no one else and that's the reason we see that the average total cost continuously keeps decreasing as the output is increasing this is where we see a natural monopoly the average cost of production falling and falling as the output is increased but if there are two players obviously the cost of production is going to be much much higher and the pricing has to change completely and that is where we see in case of monopolies we don't find any substitutable products right they advertise uh, very rarely but yes advertising is required to compete with the substitute though there are no good substitutes whatever is the decent level of substitutes that are there to to fight with them there is some amount of advertising they have a very good pricing power with them but the general tendency what we observe with respect to the monopoly is they are not maximizing the price they are not they are maximizing their profits right so sometimes they don't mind selling lesser quantity as long as it is going to give them a, a higher profit uh, per unit they may not they may not be interested in maximizing the overall profit they may be interested in maximizing even the profit per unit right so just to quickly uh, summarize these four structures the degree of product differentiation, pricing power, the kind of barriers that are available, uh, for barriers that are there for entry and exit out of the business, the non-price competition like advertising, etc., they differ from, they differ across the different structures. All of them are comparatively on the lower side in case of perfect competition. On the medium side for a monopolistic competition, higher side for an oligopoly and very, very high for a monopoly, right? And uh, the understanding of these things, which market structure this particular company is falling into, this particular industry is falling into is very much essential for an equity analyst or for a financial analyst because he would be able to forecast the future revenues, future profits. He is able to uh, put up uh, a futuristic uh, income statement and the balance sheet for the firm. Because uh, what we could see is perfect competition. Yes, price taker. So the revenues may grow only at this particular point. But oligopoly, yes, they, are the, they have some kind of a pricing power. So this is how the revenues are expected to grow. So... Uh, a, a, a proper assessment of the future estimates can very well be done by having a good understanding uh, by having a good understanding right and uh, one more characteristic of a monopoly they don't mind selling smaller quantities at higher prices because for them they are more interested in maximizing the profit per unit they may not be uh, looking at uh, overall profit maximization at all right then just trying to understand a few important uh, relationships that are going to come up in uh, each of these uh, market structures right as we have already uh, first let's focus on perfect competition for a perfect competition all the products are sold at the same price so what we see is what we see is the marginal revenue is equal to price is equal to average revenue. Right? Because all of them are being sold at the same price. The marginal revenue is equal to price equal to average revenue. The individual firm's demand function is perfectly horizontal. Right? And uh, we also see that the same line is equal, even equivalent to the marginal cost as well. 
So one thing we really need to understand in any market structure, the profit maximization output, the profit maximizing output till how long I should typically sell my product. As long as my marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost, I should keep selling it. Which means at that particular point where my marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, that is where, that is the price, uh, at, that is the quantity that I typically uh, need to sell my where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost and that is my profit maximizing output. So the firm will continue doing the production as long as uh, until the marginal revenue which is the price in this case keeps equaling to the marginal cost. As long as it is greater than the marginal cost, they are going to produce. So forget about the perfect competition, any market, if the question is about profit maximizing output, I am looking at the situation where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And here uh, in this case, mar because marginal revenue is equal to average revenue is equal to price, I could say where price is equal to the marginal cost or average revenue is equal to the marginal cost. All these things are typically uh, working out in a perfect competition. Right? So that's the reason why what we are saying is produce more and more as long as the marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost. And uh, uh, because the demand curve is perfectly uh, horizontal, the quantity sold is the highest. There is no dead weight loss coming up in, a per, in the perfect competitive markets. And the economic profit is zero in the equilibrium position. In the equilibrium uh, situation, we see that uh, the economic uh, profit is zero because, okay, let's uh, try to look at the situation. Okay, this is the situation where marginal revenue is equal to, I mean, this is the marginal revenue. Let's say uh, this is the marginal cost. Now, this is a point where marginal cost is cutting the marginal revenue. So, this is the price, right? Uh, the, 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 so, this is the price. This is the quantity that is a profit maximizing kind of a quantity. But let's say that my total cost is this much, average cost, right? I'll see that this is my ATC curve. So this is the kind of a profit that came up. This is the profit that comes up. But let's say if the price is increased a little bit, yes, the demand, uh, I mean the price, the large number of sellers are going to come up because what we see here is above the marginal cost curve, above the marginal revenue, above the price curve, whatever is the marginal cost curve, we see that it is the supply curve itself. In case of perfect competition, when I talk about the supply curve in the short run, it's the portion of the short run marginal cost curve above the average variable cost or above the average total cost. So if I look at this here in the short run, this is my let's say average total cost, that particular marginal cost curve which is above the average total cost, that is going to be my supply curve. So, when the price is going here, right now the supply is going to be somewhere here. The quantity is going to increase, the price is going to increase. This will bring new competition into the market because the entry barriers are much, much lesser. This is going to bring in more and more competitors. And more and more competitors coming up, the profits that the abnormal profits that each of the party is earning in the short run 
that is distributed by a large number of competitors and overall that abnormal or economic profit is completely getting vanished off right so that is how we see that is how we see uh, in a in a perfectly competitive market the demand curve is perfectly horizontal whereas when we come to uh, the other structures monopolistic competition or oligopoly or a monopoly first of all the demand curve is downward sloping it's not uh, it's not perfectly horizontal which means mr is lesser than the price itself right the demand curve lies above the so here this is where the typical mr curve is going to be so mr curve is much much lesser compared to that of uh, compared to that of a price in case of uh, monopolistic competition uh, monopoly and oligopoly uh, kind of markets it's not perfectly uh, horizontal and that's the reason we'll find that the price is greater than the mr itself and that's the reason we see that the elasticity is greater than 1 at least in case of uh, i mean it need not be uh, infinite because it's not a perfectly horizontal kind of a demand curve and we see that the economic profits are possible but they become zero in the long run and in in some cases they could be positive in the long run also but over time they go to zero because new players keep entering into the market and the market share is being distributed across the new competition most to zero the expenditures are typically going up to preserve even in case of monopoly we see that uh, the uh, in in case of monopoly also we see over long time it goes to zero because the expenditure some kind of spending is done by the companies to typically preserve their monopoly position right so that's where what we are uh, typically uh, see is from the profit maximizing perspective one simple point that we really need to uh, keep in mind for any firm the profit maximizing output is when the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost now when we look at the supply function whenever we are talking about a supply function it's a marginal cost curve of our all the firms in a industry so i need to understand the marginal cost curve for all the firms and in case of a perfectly competitive market it is that portion of the marginal cost curve which is above the average variable cost this is the marginal cost curve this is the average variable cost so whatever is the above the average variable cost this part this part of the curve which is above the average variable cost this is the supply function so this is uh, the supply curve altogether so in the short run it is that portion of the marginal uh, cost curve which is above the average variable cost whereas in case of long run it is that portion of the long run marginal cost curve which is above the average total cost but with respect to the other market structures the there is no the, there is no proper uh, mechanism with respect to the marginal cost and because of that reason we can't establish any well defined supply function in monopolistic competition or oligopoly or monopoly kind of markets now looking at uh, the other dimension which is the price we have already talked about uh, the kind of output that we really need to look at the marginal revenue is equal to market co uh, marginal cost that is the output that needs to be uh, produced uh, by any firm right and of course that particular let's see this is the marginal revenue where the marginal revenue is cutting the marginal cost this is the profit maximizing output so this much output needs to be produced 
right? Now, this is the demand curve. So, the price at which this need to be sold is this much because the price is typically uh, coming from the demand curve corresponding to this maximum profit maximizing output. So, this is the price that it needs to be sold at and obviously this is coming out to be the profit. Whereas, in the same differentiation if I have to look at with respect to perfect competitive market, yes, this is a marginal revenue. This is the marginal cost. So, obviously, this should be the profit maximizing output. But the demand curve also is the same. So, this should be the, uh, this should be the price at which it has to be sold which means the economic profit is not existing at all. Zero economic profit is coming up because this is the price at which you sell, this is the quantity. Whereas here, the, the profit uh, maximizing quantity that is coming from the MR curve, MR and MC intersection is talking about some particular quantity and uh, with respect to the price it is coming from the demand curve or the average revenue kind of a curve or a demand curve. So, the price is coming out to be this much. So, the price and uh, the, the quantity is uh, typically, uh, see if you are uh, typically uh, looking at the marginal revenue, see otherwise I can even uh, find out the average cost curve. Let me say that this is the average cost. So, for this quantity, this is going to be the average cost which means the difference is going to be the profit altogether. So, short run profits are very much possible in case uh, of downward sloping demand curve, the short run profits are possible because the marginal revenue curve is slightly below the uh, below the average revenue curve. So, as long as the average cost curve is understood, there is a possibility of creating some profits in the short run. And especially in case of monopolies, we observe this kind of a behavior very heavily, the price discrimination, right? Especially uh, when, I, when we uh, talk about uh, railways, uh, Indian railways, which is like a monopoly, where you have only one supplier, the government of India being providing, uh, providing the railway service. So, there is a possibility that they can... Uh, provide the service to a large number of participants by doing the price discrimination. We see that different consumers, they are charged different prices. They have uh, introduced uh, uh, a first AC service, they have introduced a second AC service, they have introduced a normal non-AC sleeper class service just to cater to the needs of different people. At the end, what it does is taking a person from one destination, from one source to one destination between two cities. But in that process, the charges are different. The, the pricing is different because, uh, uh, because there are different kinds of consumers who are able to afford different amounts for that service. So, what we should see is the demand curve should be downward sloping, which means there should be people who should be, who are ready to pay this kind of a price, there are people who are ready to pay this kind of a price, there are people who are ready to pay this price, this price. So, which means we should have a downward sloping demand curve. There should be at least two identifiable groups of customers with different elasticity of demand. So, if the price increases, probably uh, there should be customers who are really not bothered there should be customers who really uh, uh, who really uh, shift to uh, other mechanisms in case the price increases. Probably if uh, the, the cost of the travel is a significant portion of their income, which means uh, low salaried class people, if let's say airline uh, railway travel is a significant portion of their income, what we see is if the price of the railway ticket is increasing, they better stop their travel. 
so uh, uh, there is a, uh, there is a very high level of elasticity operating at that level whereas for those parties uh, whose uh, railway ticket cost is uh, a negligible portion of their uh, overall income any kind of increase in the price they are not going to react that heavily which is uh, another indication that that the price discrimination can work quite uh, effectively in that situation and at the same time the price discrimination is very effective only when we are able to prevent the customers in the lower price group to from reselling the product to the customers in the higher price otherwise it create different kinds of <coughs> arbitrage opportunities and lot of uh, black market can very well develop in that particular situation and in some cases the government gets into a regulating of a natural monopoly through various mechanisms one major mechanism that it gets in is the average cost pricing mechanism and they force the monopoly to reduce the price where the average total cost cuts the demand curve so if, okay let's see this this is the demand curve downward sloping this is the marginal revenue right okay this is the marginal cost and let's say this is the average total cost okay logically speaking where the marginal cost cuts the marginal revenue this is the profit maximizing output and for this profit maximizing output they can sell at this particular price the profit maximizing output it is going to have a marginal cost of this much average cost of this much so overall their profit part if nothing if no regulation comes up they are going to make this much of profit now what the regulation simply says is regulators especially using the average cost mechanism they talk about they try, they have to go ahead to that particular price where atc curve cuts the demand curve which means go with this much of cost right atc curve generally is more and more u shaped so go to a situation where the atc curve is cutting the demand curve so they can sell it only at this particular price rather than this price so there is a regulation that is uh, coming out wherein uh, the the parties the monopolies can typically uh, sell where the marginal uh, in they are not doing a profit maximizing output which they would have done in case there is no regulation but because they are regulated we see, what we uh, see is they have to reduce their price to such an extent where the atc curve cuts the demand curve so this results in increase in the output earlier they were able to sell only this much but now they are uh, selling an increased output price comes down allocative efficiency is going up dead weight loss is coming down and the zero economic profit scenario is coming out so though a though a natural monopoly can exist there could be restrictions and there could be regulations from the government in terms of controlling it and when we look at uh, any market structure as the demand is increasing okay let's look at this situation right now let's say the demand curve is this much supply okay marginal cost curve above the average variable cost could be the supply curve in case of perfect competition but let's look at it simple demand curve the supply curve as the demand is increasing the profits are typically going to go up because let's assume that the costs are lesser 
so the demand is increasing so the prices are going up which is resulting in a, a higher economic profit in the short run and this higher economic profit and even the higher quantity to be produced so new firms are coming in unless there are uh, barriers to entry if there are no barriers new firms are walking into the market so because of this the supply is also getting uh, increased so the supply curve also will start shifting to the right right the supply curve is getting shifted and because of the supply curve getting uh, shifted the price the equilibrium is again coming back the fall in price is happening but this time the quantity is growing so overall that new quantity that new whatever has been the new demand that is getting met initially it is getting met at a high price creating a high profit uh, scenario because of that large number of firms are entering into the market because the barriers to entry are much lesser but that that is typically uh, eating up uh, the the profits because competition is increasing the pressure in terms of reducing the prices and that is where the prices are coming down the overall quantity is increasing the same logic you can apply if there is a decreasing demand as well now when we talk about the pricing strategies for a perfect competition obviously there is no price setting they are price takers only because it's a perfectly horizontal demand curve there is no choice of price for each of the parties they are the price takers they are not the price searchers or price setters but when we uh, look at uh, for the other structures we see that it's a downward sloping curve so they will typically uh, try to look at uh, a profit maximizing output and the price at which that profit maximizing output uh, has to be set they will typically decide that particular price so wherever the marginal uh, uh, revenue is cutting the marginal costs they will try to produce that much of output and whatever is the price uh, they can set based by looking at uh, the demand function for that particular uh, uh, for that particular product wherever this profit maximizing output for whatever price it needs to be uh, the demand is existing the price would be set at that particular layer so the price is determined from the demand curve for the profit maximizing output that happens uh, in case of monopoly competition and monopoly but a big good thing about uh, the oligopoly is the demand curve is not downward sloping like this what we see is the demand curve is kinked like this so it's more and more elastic here or probably uh, let me uh, put it it's more and more inelastic here it's more and more elastic probably let me draw it slightly better which is saying up to a certain point right if you if you uh, look at uh, this particular uh, portion in the demand curve uh, at certain point it is more and more elastic at certain point it is very less elastic the reason being when there is a price decrease competitors are simply going behind decreasing the price they react very quickly if x decreases the price obviously uh, all the y z which are the competitors of x they are going to reduce the price quite drastically whereas whereas when we are uh, looking at uh, uh, after uh, an an increase in the price at higher prices at higher prices we see that it is more and more inelastic as the price is increasing we see as uh, so we we see that it is more and more inelastic the reason uh, being above the current price it is more and more elastic below the current price it is more and more inelastic because uh, 
the, the moment we see a price decrease happening, it, the, the competition is reacting to that price decrease uh, very heavily. But the moment the price increase is happening, they may not react to it at all. That's one important thing that is uh, existing with respect to the pricing strategy under an oligopoly market because there are lots and lots of assumptions about the other firm's cost structures. Instead of looking at the market demand, oligopoly is very heavily focused on the other firm's cost structures and their reaction to the price changes. And that's the reason we see that it's not a perfectly downward sloping demand curve. It's completely a kinked demand curve. And because of these things, lots and lots of collusion, cheatings, uh, trying to fix the prices, trying to fix the prices, they're not trying to increase the profits. And even this kind of prisoner's dilemmas kind of a problems are bound to happen. Okay, the simple prisoner's dilemma problem is like this. Okay, let's say we are talking about two firms A and B. So, both of them agree that we will not decrease the price beyond, let's say, $10. We'll set the maximum price at $10. They have got into a collusive agreement. Okay, let's say the costs are $7 to both of them. Now, what happens is, as long as they are setting, both of them are sticking to it, they are going to get $3 profit. But here is where one of the party can very well cheat. So, he tries to sell it, let's say, at around $8. So, he'll make a profit of $1 per unit, but he'll get very good number of customers. The customer base is going to increase and this party who is selling at 10 is losing his customer base. So overall gain wise one party might be gaining in terms of volume but the other party is losing out very heavily. The same thing even this party can cheat. But it can go to such an extent that both of them start selling at $8. Under the Assumption that the other party is going to cheat, both of them get into the cheating process, overall resulting in uh, no additional profit being created to any of the parties. So, all these things are very heavily possible under the oligopolistic structure. Price wars, knockout weak competitors, all these kinds of strategies do exist under a perfect com uh, under an oligopolistic competition, oligopolistic market structure, right? Now, how do we identify what kind of market structure this particular firm falls into? For that, we have a few measures. One, the concentration ratio for N firms, which talks about Percentage, it's a very simple calculation, percentage of market sales accounted by N largest firms in the industry. So, if I say the four firm concentration ratio, it's as good as saying take the top four firms, find out the market share, combined market share of all the four firms as a percentage of the total firm. So, the higher the number is, the higher is an indication of monopoly, oligopoly, then the monopoly, if the number is going down and down, it is becoming more into a monopolistic competition or then even into a perfect competition. It's a very simple measure to identify the what kind of market power that exists with the leaders. Whereas on the other side, we have an HHI, which is a final Hirschman index. So, it's like it goes like this. I take the largest N firms in the industry. Let's say there is uh, one firm with 30% market share, another with 20%, another with 10%, and there are, uh, there are almost uh, 30 firms with uh, just 1% market share. And probably uh, another, uh, or there are 40 firms with 1% market share. 
Now, what this head final index works out as is square the market shares of each of them. Okay, 30%. I'm just ignoring the percentages. Okay, it's 900. Then the next one is 20, 400. This is 100. Then this is 1 times 40. So, 40. So, overall, let's say it is 1440. Now, I can put the decimals uh, quite comfortably. Now, whatever that comes out, 0 0.1410 or sometimes people express it as 1440 by removing the decimals, uh, by removing the percentages. Anything is fine. Now, if this percentage is very, very high, we could see, let's say there is uh, one mechanism where there are 80% is the market share of one firm and there are 20% uh, uh, is the market share of the other firm. What is happening to the squares here? It is going to 6,800. Now, uh, limits are being set. Any number above 1,800 or 2,000, it indicates a kind of a monopoly. Or probably if we are getting uh, into or anything uh, about 2500 or 3000, it can get into a monopoly. Then 1800, anything uh, in the range of 1000 to 1800, then it can go into an oligopoly. Like this. And finally, uh, anything, uh, uh, anything uh, much, much uh, lesser than 1000. So probably a few hundred to thousand it goes into a monopolistic competition much much lesser than a few hundreds it can go into a perfect competition kind of a market. So the herfindel Hirschman index is typically uh, trying to square the market shares of the largest N firms in the industry, sum them up and then try to identify which structure is more and more appropriate to the firm. But of course. They are more and they are the ones which play a key role in terms of mergers and bringing in antitrust laws when the mergers are going to happen because they once the merger happens uh, the herfindel index changes drastically so a change in the herfindel index by some extent is going to uh, crop up the antitrust uh, laws and uh, uh, probably it can uh, stop the merger to happen as well. But of course, in some cases, they are misleading measures of market power because uh, it, it, can, it has to be understood that it has to be understood uh, that uh, uh, it is not looking up, uh, it is not looking at the niche segments of the industry it taking the market share of the industry as a whole, depending on what, how and how, how and uh, what we define as the industry, the uh, the percentages and the market shares uh, and the squares of the market shares are changing and the market structure is changing accordingly. So just to identify the market structure overall, try understanding the number of firms that are there whether they are homogeneous products or differentiated products, any kind of non-price competition is existing in terms of advertising, branding, etc. Also focus on what are the kind of barriers to entry and exit. So these are the different ones that differentiate the market uh, structures and a good understanding of uh, different market structures and what are the characteristics of each of the structures is very important. Uh, uh, from an analyst standpoint, right?